understand that God is a God of evidence. In John chapter 20, as Jesus has risen from the dead already, and the poor fellow we know is doubting Thomas, was not there the first time he appeared in his disciples, but the next week as they returned together and were assembled for fear of the Jews, we know that Thomas was there and Jesus appeared to Thomas. And rather than scolding Thomas for having doubts or for not believing everything he hears, he presents evidence and simply says, see my hands and handle my hands, stick thy finger into my side and be not faithless, but believe, right? The idea. So how could we sing that song with such confidence? I know that my Redeemer lives. Well, we know there's an empty tomb because we have eyewitness testimony. Not only do we have eyewitness testimony of these men, we have the testimony of the scriptures itself, which prove itself to be God's inspired word. Amen. So that's how we can have such confidence. We know that there is a God, and we know that the God that, that is has revealed himself through his will, and we know this to be true from the evidences presented in that book. So we can say assuredly, with all of our hearts, I know that my Redeemer lives. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Acts 7 and verse 33. I'm not going to do a review. Believe it or not. I'm not going to do a review because we got a lot of stuff to get through. So I want to make sure I get through all of it without uh, being here till actually the clock says 1230 because it's about four hours behind. Not that some of you would mind. Some of y'all might just leave and I wouldn't be actually offended by that, believe it or not. I'm just going to read the first three verses and then we'll read verse 33. Acts 7.30, speaking of Moses, but when 40 years were expired, uh, there appeared in him a wilderness, uh, in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord uh, in a flame of fire in a bush. When Moses saw what he wanted at the sight, and as he drew near to behold it, the voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Moses trembled and durst not behold. Verse 33 says, Then said the Lord to him, Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. Now, of course, this is Stephen's sermon. And Stephen is preaching this sermon to the very Jews that are just about to stone him with stones. They're going to kill him at the end of this sermon in Acts chapter 7. And Stephen is speaking to them, and he has already started at Abraham, and he has started now, uh, continued from Abraham now to Moses, and is depicting, reenacting, and going through again uh, the events of the Exodus, in which God called the people that he's now preaching to as a holy nation, reference. Exodus 19. Then he's preaching to this nation, these, these first, uh, first century Jews here in Palestine, and he's essentially implying to them that just as you rejected Jesus, and just as your forefathers rejected Moses, uh, the, the prophet of God, you're rejecting Jesus, the ultimate prophet, Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, and you're rejecting me, a preacher of the very one you persecuted, and they're going to stone him for it. So there's quite a bit of irony involved in this but i want to jump into the into the text itself verse 33 says then said the lord unto him put off thy shoes from thy feet for the place where thou standest is holy ground i want to ask you a question what makes it holy ground is the idea of a sanctuary that is a holy place is that a valid biblical idea or was the place holy because someone was actually there who was infinitely holy you know the answer. But a question I want to ask because, you know, it's sometimes even our own brethren get the idea that they borrowed from Catholicism that a certain place is a holy place. I would love to go to Rome and see the sites. I would love to see Peter's Basilica. I would love to see it. But there's nothing about this building that's holy. It's magnificent, I'm certain. I'm sure my jaw would drop and I would enjoy every moment. I would savor every picture that I would take of that place. But there is nothing about that building that is of any significance other than its architecture and beauty. That's it. Just like I would love to go see the pyramids, knowing good and well that there was nothing holy about them. But they're magnificent. Right? A, a, a place is not holy because it is, it is God's place, quote unquote. Catholicism taught the idea of the sanctuary being a holy place. Have you ever wondered, you know, what I find really interesting is the lore of some of these things. Where do things come from? Well, I think that I'd, I'd read somewhere, and again, I can't really cite the reference at the moment, nor do I know the validity of it. But like the vampire myths began essentially with Judas. You ever, what are, you know, vampires, they don't like silver, right? These creatures of the, well, that's what Judas betrayed Jesus for. Right? And, and these ideas that there's some connotation and some connection there. And, and the idea of, uh, of vampires and lore is they can't come into a church building, can they? Why? Well, that's a holy place. Well, no it isn't. 
A building is just a building. But some of our brethren have even adopted this mindset in, in saying that you can't actually eat in a church building because I guess the building's holy. We understand something being set apart for, for a specific use. We understand that, and, and I agree with that 100%. We're going to look in just a minute as, as, as some holy things that could only be used for one purpose. But let me ask you a question. Is it not important for us to have fellowship one with another as the saints and to encourage? Is that part of our purposing and assembling? Can we have a, a, a classroom setting that we have, we have tables and we could eat together in there a, a couple of times a year and have a fellowship meal and encourage? And, and could, is that not part of the purpose of this building? Sure it is. But some of our brethren have gone to the extreme that you can't even do that. Well, can we eat out on the lawn? Under a tree? Can we have a picnic out there? Oh, well, it's okay if you do it on the building. Just, you do it outside the building. Well, it's the same property. Just ridiculous. Anyway, I'm going to get there in a minute. Let's go back. Who's, who's speaking? Well, the Lord says. The Lord, this word, kurios. This word is translated in the, in the Greek um, in, a, in a bunch of different ways. It does not always deal with deity. It doesn't. Sometimes it does. This is not the transliterated word. This is not the Old Testament word for Jehovah. No, no, no. That is exclusive. This is uh, the word that is used of a king, of a dignitary, of a superior, uh, a man that is superior, or it can speak of Christ. Uh, it, it, it has various connotations that it's used. It means supreme in authority, uh, a controller, or uh, uh, look at what this says. Mister, a sign of respect to an elder or one of authority over you, right? So this is not the word that necessarily means deity, although it does mean deity in some context. Hebrews 1.10, And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens of the works of thy hands. That's the Father speaking to the Son. That is speaking of deity. Hebrews 2.3, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord? That's Jesus. Same word. So, just because it says Lord, we shouldn't make the mistake that every other religious group makes or, or these denominations make by, well... This used this word, therefore it must be this. No, 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 no. Context must determine, and this word, even Lord, is determined by context, especially, or this specific word in the New Testament anyway. Put off thy shoes. Now, here's what Barnes says in his commentary. And again, commentaries are just that, commentaries. Commentaries are learned men who have drawn conclusions based on the evidence that they've studied, and they have... Uh, basically expounded upon that for you and I so that we could benefit from their knowledge. But commentaries are just commentaries. They're the works of men. They are not inspired. So while considering commentaries, we should not rely heavily upon them, especially commentaries written by denominational folks such as Mr. Barnes. Mr. Barnes, uh, Albert Barnes, and, uh, and, and Mr. Clark, they, Adam Clark, they were very good Bible students. But again, I, I think that their Old Testament commentaries are really good. But these men didn't understand that baptism was for the remission of sins. So how much faith can we put in them, especially dealing with New Testament topics? I don't put a lot of faith in them at all. Historical references or references based on uh, secular things such as Herod, which Herod was it, which temple are we talking about, those kind of things. I've got no problem with it. And I do, re I do use them as resources at times. So I'm going to read this commentary and I think that, that he's, what he's saying here is, is spot on. Barnes says to put off the shoes or sandals was an act of reverence. The ancients were especially not permitted to enter a temple or a holy place with their shoes on. Indeed, it was customary for the Jews to remove their shoes whenever they entered any house as a mere matter of civility. Do you understand now why they would wash feet as part of the process of greeting and preparation? You wore sandals through the desert. What, your feet probably going to get a little dirty. So when you walk in somebody's house, well, here's a basin to wash your feet, right? It was custom. But the idea is before they would enter a sanctuary or a holy place, quote unquote, out of reverence for the one who makes it holy, they would what? I'm going to take my shoes off. It's like us today. I don't know about you, but uh, I don't say prayers with a hat on. Me personally, I just don't do it. Out of respect, reverence, it may be perfectly fine. I don't know. But it violates my conscience. So, uh, you know, when they have the Pledge of Allegiance, what do people do? Take their hat off and put it across their chest. Whatever, that's fine. But what is that a sign of? 
It's reverence, it's respect for the, the flag, the country, and the people who died to make it free, right? So it's the same idea here is this would be the same custom as, as, I, as I don't do that either. Take off your shoes, it's holy ground. Take your hat off when you pray to God, right? Or, or whatever the case may be. It's, 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 a, it's a custom, but you understand the significance and the reasons behind it. Joshua 5 and verse 15 says, And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereupon thou standest is holy. Now the question is, why? Why was it holy? We understand that they would do this out of reverence for, for God. If I'm going to approach God, if I'm going to be in a place where God's presence is symbolized, let's say, in the temple with the Ark of the Covenant, I'm going to dress and act a certain way, and I'm going to only do certain things, right? Again, this goes right back to the idea of reverence instead of, or contrasted to flippance, right? To have a flippant attitude. Holy ground. A thing or a place is not holy because of some inherent or intrinsic value. The Ark of the Covenant was not a holy piece of furniture just because it was made of gold or overlaid with gold. The Ark of the Covenant was not holy except for the fact that God said it was. And God said, this will symbolize my presence with you. And once a year, I will commune with the high priest after he's offered blood, after that incense is wafted into the most holy place. And when my conditions are met, and you sprinkle blood upon that altar and upon the horns of the, of the, the, uh, the mercy seat, then I will commune with him. And God, his Shekinah, the, the glory of the Lord, the, 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 that fog or that smoke would fill the temple, and it would just be a, a marvelous sight. And the idea again is, is that it's only holy because God's presence is symbolized there. That's the only thing that makes it holy. If it's holy, it's because God has set it apart for a certain use. Now, this word holy, it's kodesh, a sacred place or thing, sanctity, consecrated, dedicated. Think about that. Dedicated to a specific purpose. That's hallowed, holiness, Holy saint sanctuary. These words are all used for it. But the idea is, what does it mean to be hallowed? What does it mean to be sanctified? What does it mean to be dedicated? Well, we say dedicated to us, that has a slightly different idea than these other words. <clears throat> well, if you are a mechanic or if you are an engineer, you know that one part or one section of some machine is dedicated. Its exclusive purpose is this, right? That's the idea of holy. It has an exclusive purpose. This. What about this in Exodus 12? We're going to go through a lot of these. Exodus 12. And in the first day there shall be an holy convocation. What's going on in Exodus 12? Well, the tenth plague is about to come upon Egypt. The tenth, the final, the most horrific, the most mind-boggling. The firstborn of every man... And even of the beast, right? Human beings and beasts would die, the firstborn or the cattle. And he says, and in the first day there shall be an holy convocation. Now convocation means assembly or meeting. There would be a holy convocation associated with the Passover. And in the seventh day there shall be a holy convocation. Do you remember when we were talking about what day did Jesus die on? And everybody thinks it's Friday. Well, if you do the math on Friday, it doesn't work. I'm sorry. It just doesn't work. But if you go and you look at some of the, the things we studied, how the Passover week had more than one Sabbath day. The first day was a holy convocation and the seventh day was a holy convocation. And this is the, the meaning of what, uh, of what we, uh, we studied there and we looked at on the day that Jesus died. And that Sabbath day being a high day, that was because it was associated with the Passover. But in this it says, In the seventh day there shall be an holy convocation unto you. No manner of work shall be done in them, save that which every man must eat. That only may be done. Verse 17, And you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. For in this selfsame day have I brought, you, uh, brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day in your generations by an ordinance forever. In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month at even, you shall eat unleavened bread until the one and twentieth day of the month at even. 
Now, it was a holy assembly. It was a holy meeting. It was a holy convocation. Why? What was important about the first day or the seventh day? Well, we know that God sanctified the seventh day, but he did so when he called his nation out of this captivity, Deuteronomy chapter 5. We'll see that. As a matter of fact, it's, it begins in Exodus 16. But the Sabbath day in that context was holy because God said it was holy. And he did it as a test for these folks. And to remind them, why was this convocation holy? Because God said it was holy. There was nothing in and of itself that was holy. They wouldn't have known what day of the month it was. They wouldn't have known what month it was. Had God not directed them and said, this is the first month. This is this day. And this is what you're going to do. So it was holy simply because God said it was. Verse 14 says, And this day shall be unto you a memorial, and you shall keep it a feast uh, to the Lord throughout your generations. And you shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. What was the big deal? Why was it set apart? Because God said do it. What about Exodus 19? Exodus 19 verse 6 says this. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. Now Peter quotes that in 1 Peter chapter 2. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Why were they a holy nation? Was there something inherent in Abraham's lineage? Was there some special genes there? Was that what made it holy? No. These people weren't the best. They weren't the brightest. These aren't MIT grads we're talking about. These were... A descendant of Abraham, there was nothing special about the fleshly lineage. It was the character of the forefathers and the promise he made to them that God considered and kept this nation. Look at Exodus 19 and verse 3. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called him out of the mountain, saying, thou shalt, uh, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians. How I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Verse 5 says, Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all the earth, for all the earth is mine. How would they be a holy nation? Verse 6. By listening and obeying God's will. Verse 5. Oh, you mean there was nothing really special about them in the first place? Not really. Other than the fact that God made the promise to their forefathers. There are some folks that argue that there was some holiness in some physical being of Abraham. No, there wasn't. I don't understand this, this idea that, oh, well, they had to keep the lineage pure. What was so pure about it? Yeah, we understand it. That, and I guess that was it because uh, I, I responded to someone who said that, uh, why didn't they allow, if God's not a, if God's not a racist... Why didn't God allow the nation of Israel to intermingle with other people? Well, they, they, what they mean is people of other color, I suppose, is what they're trying to say. And I said it has nothing to do with that. It had everything to do with their idolatry. God didn't want this nation to be uh, mingled in with individuals who are idolaters and pagans and heathens. And then somebody would say, oh, well, I also wanted to keep the lineage pure. Well, my question is, how pure was the lineage? Abraham... Good guy, right? Overall, a faithful man, a great man of faith. Abraham had his problems. Abraham was a liar. Abraham uh, was an adulterer with, Bash, uh, with Bathsheba. That's David. I'm getting to him. With Hagar. Moses had multiple wives. And really, that's the only bad thing said about Moses. Other than the Moses one mistake, number 20. Out of all of them we talk about usually, Moses is probably the best one. Don't even get started on David. You know that in, in Matthew and in Luke, you have two different depictions of the lineage of Jesus. And you know that they're, they're obvious, they're completely different lineages. Look, look for them yourself. They're completely different. And, and some people would even cry contradiction. Well, you know, one is the supposed lineage of Jesus through Joseph. And one is the actual blood lineage of Jesus through Mary. And do you know that one of those lists, you ready? Bathsheba, the father of Solomon. You mean to tell me that that's a pure lineage when part of that lineage involves a, an adulterous union with a woman who, who David's husband, uh, her husband David killed? You're telling me that's a, a pure fleshly lineage? Ridiculous. It has nothing to do with it. 
Yes, the lineage of, of, of Abraham, that was going to be the seed of woman, Galatians 3.16, absolutely. But don't act like, oh, that was some, uh, you know, some 42 generations of just pure physical genes. Get real. Had everything to do with their attitudes toward God. Same thing here. They would be a holy nation if they were obedient to God. What about this one? <clears throat> Exodus 25, beginning of verse 21. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above the ark. And in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. And there will I meet with thee. And I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat. From between the two cherubim which are upon the ark of the testimony. Of all things which I give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. What about the most holy place? Why was it the most holy place? Or the holy of holies? Why? You remember the tabernacle when they built it. They, they built the curtain. And they separated that one inner room from the outer room. And that outer room was still separated from the outer court. You had the outside, outer court. Then you had the inside, the sanctuary or the holy place. Then you had a veil between the holy place and the most holy place. Why? Why was that a most holy place? Because God would actually come and his presence would be symbolized in that place. And remember, Hebrews 9 and 10 Access into this place wasn't given to just everybody. The purpose was they realized that under that covenant, they didn't have what they needed, right? It was an inferior covenant, but it pointed to something greater. Hebrews 9 and verse 7, But in the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. The Holy Ghost this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while the first tabernacle was yet standing. What was the first tabernacle? Oh, he means way back there when they were making the tabernacle after the Exodus. No, no, no. That's the covenant of Moses. The first tabernacle is the law of Moses. That covenant. While that covenant was standing, access to God was restricted to the high priest once a year. Nobody else. But Jesus, who was the antitype of God's high priest, he made access available to everybody now. Remember that, remember that veil was rent from top to bottom, Matthew 27, 51? Through Christ, we all now have access to God. That's why he's high priest. Right? What about holy garments? Well, that's a nice shirt. What do they always say? I wore my holy, my church socks because they have holes in them. Not that kind of holy. Why are they holy? Why are, why are they set apart? Do you and I have clothes that maybe we wear to worship and nowhere else? I don't know. That's not really what it's talking about. But in Exodus 28, look at this. And take thou unto thee Aaron thy brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel that he may minister unto me in the priest's office, even Aaron and Nadab and Abihu. Y'all remember them? And Eleazar and Ithamar, Aaron's sons. And thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron thy brother for glory and beauty. Because the work of the priesthood was a, a prestigious work and the outer garments that they wore would symbolize... What we look like spiritually. Glorious. Beautiful. Wonderful. Good thing I don't have to look that way physically, right? But spiritually. That's how we look to God if we're faithful to God. Why were they holy garments? God said design them this way. They would be for, for, for beauty. They would be for, for uh, uh, expressing what is to come. The inner man. That's how we are to look. What about this one? Exodus 30 and verse 22. Moreover, the Lord said unto Moses, saying, Take thou also unto thee principal spices of pure myrrh, 500 shekels, of sweet cinnamon, half so much, even 250 shekels, and of sweet calamus, 250 shekels, and of cassia, 500 shekels, and after the shekel of the sanctuary, and uh, of, oil, of oil, olive oil, a hen. And thou shalt make of it a holy ointment, an ointment compound after the art of the apothecary. And it shall be an oil, a holy anointing oil. And thou shalt anoint the tabernacle of the congregation therewith, and the ark of the testimony. And the table, and all his vessels, and the candlestick, and his vessels, and the altar of incense, and the altar of burnt offering, with all the vessels, and the labor, and his foot. Thou shalt sanctify them, that they may be most holy. Whosoever toucheth them, or whatsoever toucheth them, shall be holy. And thou shalt anoint Aaron and his sons, and consecrate them that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. And thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, This shall be an holy uh, anointing oil unto me throughout your generations. Upon man's flesh shall it not 
be poured. Neither shall ye make any other like it after the composition of it. For it is holy, and it shall be holy unto you. Whosoever compoundeth any like it, or whosoever putteth any of it upon a stranger, shall be cut off from among his people. Now that's, that's a euphemism for dead. They're going to kill you. What could you do with this oil? Well, this specific oil that had these specific ingredients, you could use it for one purpose. And that was sanctifying the tabernacle and the, and the priesthood and all the, the instruments of service. Man, I really like the smell of that. Can I put it on in the morning before I go to work? Can I, can I wear it before I go on a date? Yeah, if you want to die, go ahead. You see, the idea of what made this holy. Well, God set it apart for a specific reason. Now, Titus 2.11 says, The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, godly, and righteously in this present world, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us, that he might purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. You know what? We're supposed to be set apart also. Set apart for a specific purpose of doing God's will on earth. Holy perfume, Exodus 30 and verse 34. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take unto these sweet spices, uh, stacked, and, oh, I can't say all these. I'm not even going to try. Exodus 30 and verse 34. These sweet spices with pure frankincense, of there shall be a like weight, and thou shalt make it a perfume, a confection after the art of the apothecary, tempered together, pure and holy. And thou shalt beat some of it very small, and put uh, of it before the testimony in the, the tabernacle, where I will meet with thee. It shall be unto you most holy. And as for the perfume which thou shalt make, ye shall not make it to yourselves. According to the competition, uh, composition thereof. It shall be unto thee holy for the Lord. And whosoever shall make it like it in themselves. That smells the same. He'll be cut off from the people. Do we see a consistent theme? What made the ground holy? Well God was there. What made the meeting holy? Well God said this is going to be a holy remembrance for you. What made the oil holy? God says, I set it apart for a certain reason. What made the garments holy? God said, I'll make them after this design to demonstrate that the high priest is to be a glorious position. Right? It's to, it's to, bear, it's to, to shine some light, have some glory here. What made all this glorious and holy? God says, I've set it apart for this purpose. Use it for this purpose only. Think about that as far as worshipful songs used with instruments or worshipful songs used for some other purpose right the idea now there are ideas that that this does not apply to if it if it applied in every instance in every aspect you couldn't drink, drink uh, grape juice at home could you is it okay to drink grape juice at home yeah it's fine but is that not set apart for a specific reason that's not the same principle here. That's not a principle that has been established. We use a common element, fruit of the vine, to remember this. Yes. But that doesn't mean that you and I can't drink grape juice at home. This is not the same principle. So there are limited aspects of these principles, but this is still a very important and powerful principle to remember, especially as it relates to our lives. We're supposed to be set apart for this purpose. So we understand that from the oil, from the perfume, from various others. In Leviticus 10 and verse 8, it says this, And the Lord spake unto Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine, nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons, with thee. When you go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. And it shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. Well, that's interesting, because when the priests were doing service, the priests could not drink. What about us today? Is it every aspect of our lives service to God? Should you be drinking? No, same idea, but that's not what I wanted to look, look at. I want to look at verse 11. That ye may put the difference between holy and unholy, clean and unclean. That you may know, because you're in your right senses and your mind isn't muddled with intoxicating beverage, that you may understand that there is there are holy things and there are unholy things. And I want you to know the difference. I want you to be sober-minded and I want you to be clear-thinking so that you may know this distinction. That they may teach the children of Israel all the statutes of the Lord that were given by Moses. Same principle I would say to us. 
We need to study the idea of holiness, the idea of some things being holy and, and not holy, and why? Because God said they were, so that we may know the distinction between that which is good and holy and that which is not. I think that's an important principle for us. So I had a lot to get through, got through it all. We're going to stop there and offer the invitation. Are there any here this uh, afternoon that have never obeyed the gospel? If you've never obeyed the gospel, then by definition you're not holy. You've not been sanctified, 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 11. You've not been set apart by your obedience to the gospel. We must hear the word of God. Romans 10 and verse 17. Faith comes by hearing. We must believe in Jesus Christ. John 8 and 20, uh, verse 24. We must uh, repent of our sins. Luke 13 3. We must uh, acknowledge our faith in Christ. Matthew 10 32. And we must be baptized for the remission of our sins. Colossians 2 11 through 13. Those who do so are added to the one and only church forgiven of all sins. And that fellowship that you've broken has been restored with God. Christ has made that possible. Romans 5, 11. For those who have obeyed the gospel, if you're not faithful, repent. Remember that you were set aside for a purpose, and that is your purpose. Repent. Come on back and, and acknowledge your sin, and God will forgive you, and that fellowship will be restored. You will once again be in that holy condition and remain that way all the days of your life. We're going to sing an invitation song. If any have need, we would encourage you to let us know whatever need you may have, and we'll help you in any way we can. The invitation is yours. Please come now as we stand and sing.